Thank you for joining us today. This is Bill Baker at Firestorm. We're pleased to be presenting this webinar today in conjunction with the New Jersey MEP. Uh, the topic today is on social media. Our moderators are these two good-looking gentlemen that you see on the screen, Joe Caratanuto. Uh, Joe is with the New Jersey MEP. And Blair Neville is located in New Jersey, and he's a principal of Firestorm. And they will be glad to discuss whatever you need and help you out however they can. We invite you to be our friend on Facebook at Firestorm Solutions. And we also, you can follow us on Twitter at Firestorm Soul. There is a hashtag for this session, and it's hashtag FSCrisis. The New Jersey MEP and Firestorm do present this Crisis Coach webinar series. This is one in the series. These webinars occur roughly once a month. Today's topic is social media and manufacturing. You can visit Firestorm.com to watch previous webinars, and you can also register for the future webinars as they come up. Firestorm.com also has a lot of information there you may be interested in. We've got a whole bunch of white papers that uh, are interesting that you can download for free. We have the Disaster Ready People book, which you may also download for free. And you can also you know, visit our blogs and browse around and see what we have. Lots of interesting stuff there. The presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. And the work product we discuss today must be read in conjunction with local guidance and your organization's personal counsel. Keep in mind that this information is not to be construed as legal advice or legal opinion. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and we empower you to manage your risks and crises. Firestorm has expertise in crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communication, crisis public relations, and consequence management, in addition to social media, which we're going to be discussing today. I'd like to introduce to you Karen Masuno. Karen is the Executive Vice President of Social Media for Firestorm. She is a true expert in social media, and she brings all kinds of information to us that we can, can follow and to develop a strategy and a policy within organizations. Uh, Karen, over to you. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you, Joe and Blair, for inviting me today and the entire membership. I um, am excited to cover some things about social media with you today, specifically as they pertain to the manufacturing environment. I'd also like to add, for any of you watching the session today, or if you'd like to share this session with other members of the association, you can share the original URL that you used to register. So if you just go back to that link, it will take you to a screen. You just pop in your email, and if you've already registered, uh, you'll be able to see a replay. And for those who haven't, who you'd like to share it with, it, just fill out that quick form, and they'll go ahead and see the replay of today's session. Today we're going to talk about social media and manufacturing, and we're going to look at some current events in the news. In a crisis, we're going to look at who's talking. We're going to look at the messaging and who's listening to your messaging. We're going to look at some people who get it right, and then talk a little bit about what's next. So let's just jump right in. Recently in the news, you may be aware that there was a significant event that happened at a manufacturing facility for feeding grain in Omaha. As this specific issue unfolded, it unfolded very quickly on Twitter. Twitter is a micro, it's considered a micro-blogging application. You are limited to character amounts, and it's for short, quick messaging. In this situation, the images of the facility, the images of uh, trucks that were uh, damaged, the images of the employees leaving uh, the facility that had escaped from the 
explosion were immediately shared on Twitter and then subsequently on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. As a matter of fact, some employees that had been trapped in the uh, facility were not only using their cell phones for light in order to escape the <coughs> facility, but were also uh, sharing their own images that they had taken. So it, first you have a very tragic situation of an explosion that was caused for some un unknown reason. You have a facility that may not have uh, uh, specific offices. Your corporate offices may be somewhere else. So constituency, news media, uh, families may find out about an event before your own uh, crisis management folks do that may be off-site at another facility. So this really illustrates how quickly today information is communicated. You'll also notice that in addition to some of the images we see from uh, in the top left, uh, I believe Erin Golden was a reporter um, for, for the, uh, uh, and you'll see that the Omaha World Herald uh, got permission and then retweeted and reshared that. You don't need permission to reshare it. But you'll also see that the Omaha Police Department was on the scene tweeting and the Omaha uh, Cops Reporters, which is a, a crime sort of uh, official account, they were also tweeting damage. Uh, so before you can even get to your facility, it is possible that images of damage and other uh, critical issues uh, are going to be shared with the public. So crises happen today in a way that have never happened before. And sadly, uh, the uh, plant fire did claim lives. There were quite a number of injuries. That's just how fast it happened. So, so let's really look at a, a longer term example of a crisis. And let's look at who's talking in a crisis. Social media requires a completely different skill set. And social media is not just about marketing. I think that's the challenge here is that marketers quickly adopt new technologies that allow them the ability to communicate messages quickly. So they jump on the bandwagon, they're out there using Twitter and Pinterest, and for some manufacturers the feeling is, well, this really doesn't relate to my facility. We're not a business to consumer uh, company. Um, we've always had, you know, a pretty, uh, we're known by our customers. Uh, our supply chain is set. We don't really need to leverage social media. For you, it's more important, I think, than anyone to leverage social media specifically for crisis management and crisis communication. So let's look at the Charleston, West Virginia water contamination, chemical contam contamination that happened recently. What was interesting about this is the way this event unfolded, I have a sister who was at Ground Zero. And my sister is really plugged into the news. We're kind of newsy people. She didn't find out about the issue until approximately 8 p.m. in the evening, and she found out via message from someone else on Facebook, even though the event actually started occurring at 7.30 in the morning. The West Virginia water contamination was, was uh, labeled a federal disaster. It originated at Freedom Industries late Thursday morning. Around 7.30 in the morning, there was a smell in the air that people had reported, a licorice smell. And I believe uh, that inspectors arrived at around uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. They discovered that the company had taken no spill containment measures uh, to combat the chemical Bill that put the drinking water supplies off limits, eventually to about 300,000 people. A specific water company used uh, that water source for their water cu uh, customers, about 300,000. The State Department of Environmental Protection said Freedom Industries violated the West Virginia Air Pollution Control Act and the Water Pollution Control Act by allowing the chemical 
uh, to escape from its facility just upstream from West Virginia America's water regional intake, which was the Elk River. Um, and what I want to, I'm sorry, <laughs> what I want to illustrate on this page is that very quickly there were suddenly a variety of modes of communication coming out about this issue. However, we didn't hear from the actual company, Freedom Industries, until almost 36 hours later. At first, the water company was targeted as being at fault. They worked very hard to coordinate, however, with local city, state government, with the official inspectors, with all of the people that they were supposed to, um, about the crisis that was occurring. It was my observation that that messaging then from the governor and from the local authorities was not as thorough and consistent as it needed to be. And there was no communication from the manufacturer themselves. The governor did issue uh, a caution, a do not use uh, situation. But that information wasn't shared with the public until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Meanwhile, people were still bathing. They were drinking. They were uh, making formula for babies. And throughout this, the chief health officer for the health department issued an order that said restaurant, bars, daycare centers, other businesses with a health permit, which there were about 1,200 of those, including hospitals, would be sent a message to cease operations immediately. Interestingly enough, when the news went out that night, there were still several res restaurants that were open. They said they hadn't gotten the message. Meanwhile, manufacturers in the area were really scrambling. Those companies that used water as a part of their process, and all of you on the phone who are sitting there thinking of all the ways you use water as a part of your process, the challenge was they didn't really understand what the chemical was. When I looked up the chemical on Chemical Book, the very first thing this chemical said was do not dilute with water. So they didn't know if it was flammable, if there was a fire at their facility, whether they could use, whether the local fire department would be allowed to use water to put it out. Uh, they were scrambling to find backup water sources. This was a really challenging event that unfolded very, very quickly and involved quite a number of uh, local, state, and federal officials. In the middle of it, Aaron Brockovich shows up. Erin Brockovich decided this was a great opportunity to sell her new book and showed up for a community meeting. As you can see in the top left hand, we have people lining up at water tanks for water. We had a video conference with uh, Virginia, West Virginia American Water President Jeffrey McIntyre. He did a great job. He made himself very available, stuck to the facts. And then we have Gary Southern. We're going to talk about him in just a moment. He was or is the president of Free Freedom Industries. John Stewart jumped on the bandwagon. So suddenly we had a whole bunch of people commenting on an issue at one small manufacturing facility in West Virginia. Um, one of the things that I really want to highlight in this image and things that we tell you during a crisis event, this a uh, news conference was shared, reshared live on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on all of the other uh, applications, but nowhere in this image will you see a representative from Freedom Industries. This was the official account uh, with uh, the uh, local water uh, president, Jeff McIntyre, with the National Guard, um, with uh, uh, the governor, and they were trying to get a handle on what the issue was. We know that in manufacturing facilities, water use includes water for purposes of fabricating, processing, washing, diluting, cooling, transporting your product. There's uh, water incorporated into all aspects of the manufacturing process. In the case of West Virginia, knowing so little about the chemical compound created a lot of confusion for manufacturers. And suddenly they were being told late at night that it could be two weeks 
that not only they themselves personally, their families, their communities, their employees, but their facilities would be without a water source. So not only do we have the impact of freedom industries and their lack of response in their own chemical spill, but suddenly we had other manufacturers in the area in a crisis themselves saying, how do we continue with our manufacturing processes? During this period of time, as I've mentioned, Freedom Industries was very quiet. However, all of you on the call have family members, spouses, partners, and you discuss things that are going on in your work life. And that's what happened to the president of Freedom Industries. Now, there's some confusion. There are actually a couple of different presidents of Freedom Industries because right at the end of the year, uh, the company was bought. So the person that we saw eventually as the spokesperson for Freedom Industries is not actually the president that we saw later. And that person has a fiancé named Kathy Stover Kennedy. Kathy Stover Kennedy, the fiancé of the second president of Freedom Industries, decided to take the case to Facebook. She decided to speak on behalf of her fiancé in the company. And talk a little bit about what she knew officially about this leak. Now, I want you all to think about, you've already, been, you're in the middle of a crisis, and then one of your family members or friends decides to share some information with the public that you would prefer not to have shared. It is a true Marie Antoinette moment. She says, I'm not asking for anyone's sympathy, but a little empathy wouldn't hurt, and just so you know, the boys at the plant made and drank coffee this morning. I showered and brushed my teeth this morning, and I'm just fine. Just let that sink in for a moment. That was a post on Facebook that went viral. It was shared in major news organizations. This was shared and reshared and became a meme across the web. Now, once the official announcements came out, and about a 24-hour uh, period had gone by. Actually, the following Saturday, the governor hosted a community web, con uh, web conference to try to answer people's questions. And that weekend, that Friday evening, the company responsible, Freedom Industries, filed for bankruptcy um, because this is going to be a significant financial uh, event uh, for that company. Since that period of time, I show you this image because there's been another incident in West Virginia. And this group is calling for volunteers needed in the West Virginia water crisis. Sounds nice. Sounds like people are volunteering and they want to help. But this, these are the Occupy Wall Street folks. The Occupy Wall Street folks have significant leverage experience and knowledge in how to reach a significantly large group of people leveraging social media. And they are calling for volunteers to descend and occupy this West Virginia area. Well, as a manufacturer in this area, I need to know that. Even though I'm not responsible for the water crisis, I'm not Freedom Industries, I need to know that suddenly a bunch of protesters are going to show up. And I wonder if my industry is going to become a target of this as well. By monitoring on social media, you'll be able to see some of these things that are happening in your own industry and create plans in case they do. Additionally, CNN now, a month later, has picked up and is resurfacing resurfacing the water crisis. So Freedom Industries may have thought, OK, after a couple of weeks, it sort of died down. Now it's back to being a state issue instead of a national issue. And then CNN has picked it back up again and did an undercover report. And again, on February 12th, a coal preparation facility was breached and sent over 100,000 gallons of coal liquid waste from a West Virginia coal preparation facility into the nearby water supply. So you have two significant issues occurring in a very short period of time. Look, there's a social media fail. Let's go tweet about it. There's nothing more that folks on Twitter like than somebody's failure. 
And there's nothing more than folks on Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and probably in your neighborhood likes and someone else's failure. It's something, we, it's something that ends up going viral. Well, what was it about this situation? Very specifically, if there is a recording of you today, tomorrow, at any time, it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on Vimeo, and it's going to be shared. Gary Southern, the president who became the spokesperson for Freedom Industries, I'd like you, if you get a chance, to Google it and watch the video in its entirety, because it's an excellent example of what you should never, ever do. He showed up completely unprepared. He showed up with bottled water that he continually drank throughout the press conference. He had no information. He said he was tired. He was exhausted. It had been a long day. And people <coughs> were panicking and desperate for information. And sadly, Mr. Southern didn't stick to any formula, had no prepared crisis messaging. <coughs> Forgive me. I had a little tickle in my throat. And um, compounded it by drinking that bottled water throughout uh, the session. This went viral in such a way that um, really we haven't seen uh, since the Gulf oil spill. <coughs> Additionally, that Saturday in bankruptcy court testimony, Freedom Industries' Gary Southern called the 12 days since the company's chemical spill completely chaotic. The one thing that we don't want messaging to come from, from someone who's experiencing a crisis, is that it was chaotic. What we want you to be able to say is that you acknowledge an incident occurred, that you are working with investigators to understand the source, that you have taken action to clean it up to assure it doesn't happen again, charitable and philanthropic things you're doing in order to benefit. The, the last thing that you really want to say is that it's been completely chaotic. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, Southern said that money isn't the solution to lift the stigma on his company for its suppliers and customers. He said the spill was causing perception problems for the firm. I really believe what caused perception problems for this manufacturer was the person that they put out in front to be their spokesperson. Additionally, Freedom Industries didn't report until much later that a secondary chemical also entered the water system when that spill occurred. So let's talk a little bit about messaging and leveraging social media to do that. The first thing Firestorm always uh, talks about when we talk about messaging in a crisis is your job is to build maintain and restore trust. Your teams need to get together and say, who is the best person to be able to do that in our, our organization? Why companies continually put an exhausted, stressed CEO in front of the cameras and microphone, I'll never quite understand, especially someone who hasn't slept for 24 or more hours. They probably haven't eaten. They, they, they <coughs> in this case, didn't drink water. And that may not be the best person to be put to put in front of cameras and microphones. Additionally, you want to be able to approve knowledge, improve knowledge and understanding. Bill, I just need a quick second. I need to take a sip of water, okay? <coughs> it's interesting. We start My talking apologies. about water and uh, away you go. <laughs> Geez, I have a little sinus thing going on, and it, it, it just gave me a little, little tickle. Okay, so we want to improve knowledge and understanding in a situation. The way to do that with your spokesperson is to have pre-prepared message maps. You need to walk through every scenario of a crisis that could occur and create the correct messaging for those situations. And Joe and Blair on the call can certainly um, reach out to them if you have questions, and we can help and guide you in this direction. And you want to guide and encourage the appropriate attitudes, decisions, action, and behaviors of your company, its employees, their families. Do you need to train your family members not to post comments on Facebook about what happened? Yes. 
Those are conversations you must have. And you need to encourage collaboration and cooperation. In this case, the opportunity for Freedom Industries to quickly collaborate with state officials, inspectors, the water company itself, was monument, and they did not do that. Additionally, they weren't collaborating with their peers, with their fellow manufacturers. Had they done that groundwork previously, they would have had support and they would have had a plan that was beneficial to all of the manufacturers in the area. I want to talk Blair? to you about a key point. Yes? Hey, this is Blair. Um, I have a, a question that um, if you can help me with. Generally, um, when you look at these responses coming out in 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 emergency situation like this from bloggers and people that may may or may not be involved in all of this, how what's the best way for a company to respond? Should they respond on the web? Should they should they answer some of these questions on the web, or should it be done at a news conference? I mean, how 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 do you sort of try to diffuse a lot of this, this information that may or may not be correct? That is such a great question. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that unfolds in, in, in just okay. a couple of slides. But okay. Good. Good. if you're, Blair, if you're not the first one communicating official information about what happened and you don't have your social channel set up to crisis message, other people will control your message. That is a critical point of what we do. If we're prepared, if we predict, we know through, we use, a, Firestorm uses a predict, plan, perform methodology. We know something's going to happen. It may not happen today, may not happen next month, may not happen in 20 years, but we know something's going to happen. So we can predict something will happen. We can plan for that. We can create message maps. We can create specific messages for Twitter, specific messages for Facebook and other applications. And our official messaging when we work with official inspectors. And then we can perform so that when a crisis does happen, you have an official channel that uses the official terminology of that social medium in order to get that message out. When we first started this session, we said the hashtag for today's session was going to be FS Crisis. It's something that we use on Twitter and now Facebook that allows you to get your message into the stream. We have seen so many instances. Rhode Island University had an instance earlier last year where they, they had great messaging. They were, they were right on top of the crisis that was occurring, but they didn't use the official hashtag that everyone else was using. So their official, clear, concise messaging did not get into the stream that media looks at to pick up. So we'll talk about that. We've only got about, I'm, I'm talking too much, and I'm going to lose my, <laughs> lose my time here. Um, but I want to really then stress the difference between why we're communicating in the first place. This is a PR event. A PR event is when you have something great to announce, something that's wonderful for your company or your organization, and you want people to know about it. Um, John W. Kennedy is the new CEO of the NJMEP. That's a PR event. That's something exciting we want to share. This is someone using your crisis for their PR event. Erin Brockovich decided to descend down. She was going to have a couple of meetings, and she um, was on all of the different news channels as the expert and selling her book. This is a crisis. First responders were probing uh, the explosion at uh, the ball bearing plant in New Hampshire. That's a crisis for a manufacturer. And this is a crisis on social media. As soon as that ball bearing uh, plant explosion occurred, it was all over social media within seconds. USA Today, Fox News, uh, all of the local news. We've even got the BBC uh, picking up on it very quickly, and it was shared and reshared via social media, which is where I found out about it. Within 29 seconds of my uh, search, I found uh, the search was returned in that time. Um, 
there were already more than 7,500 results in a very, very short period of time, in blog articles and others. That's a crisis on social media. On social media, if you're not monitoring, you're really missing. <clears throat> your, your marketing teams may be leveraging social media in some ways. They may be communicating with customers and others. But if you're not watching what's going on, if you're not looking at keywords in your industry, if you're not doing more than setting alerts on Google, you may miss very critical situations that occur. We monitor for a variety of customers at Firestore and our clients. And I, about sometime last year, I saw that there had been an explosion at a retail facility for one of our clients. And we quickly alerted them. We alerted them before their own crisis management team alerted them. That's how effective marketing can be. But also, that's the power of social media. I saw it on Twitter, and we notified the client. This crisis that we're looking at was just a very quick view of that explosion at that New Hampshire manufacturing ball bearing facility. Within a matter of a very short period of time, there were almost 700,000 mentions of that event. And this picture that you're looking at is a combination of social media. So we monitor Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, et cetera. Um, and then we could also show you where the focus of uh, the messaging was. And that was actually in less than a 24-hour period. So when we talk about crisis messaging and monitoring and then Blair's question of what do we do and how do we respond, it is really specific to the incident. Um, there are times when we advise you to message back on Facebook people who may be, may be messaging to you. But in the case of Freedom Industries on their Facebook account, when they suddenly had more than 420,000 comments on their page, there would be a different strategy employed. Actually, our strategy would have been to manage it more effectively from the beginning. But if you are going to be working and selecting a, a spokesperson, if you are going to be preparing crisis me messaging that guides and informs and educates your constituency and your community, I'm going to give you a very simple uh, a, a template to leverage. And this is via, again, our crisis uh, Firestorm Expert Council member, Linda Tavlin. Uh, this is one of my favorite things uh, I've worked with, and it is uh, via her expertise. In a crisis situation, the first thing you do is humanize. The first thing you say is, um, at Freedom Industries, we are uh, deeply concerned that there has been an event at our facility uh, because um, we value the health and uh, uh, the health and, and safety of our community and also our families because we are customers of our own product, and you make yourself a part of the process by making yourself a customer of your own product, which you most certainly are. You then must defer to the experts, because in a situation such as this at a manufacturing facility, you may not be allowed to speak. You may, you may be required to defer to experts. We are working with the local EPA, the local health department, the Department of Homeland Security, in order to establish specifically what happened. What I can tell you is this, and then you want to simply give the facts. At 8.30 a.m. this morning, an incident was identified. The chemical uh, that has been identified has been such and such, we will deliver more facts as they become available. Humanize, be part of the process, defer to the experts, and give the facts. For everyone on this call, I want to ask you a question to think about. Do you know what Storify is? Have you ever heard of it before? If you don't know what Storify is, you should. It is not a social media 
application per se. It is a tool used by news aggregators, who can be an individual or a news organization, to create a stream of news stories related to a specific event. And they can then capture everything being said about that event from text messages to Twitter messages to breaking news announcements to other sources. They can then publish that as a newsletter, as a, as a web-based paper to their community and constituents. So if I have 400,000 people on my email list, I can say, hey, here's the recent update via our Storify page. And every mention of you, every mention you make will then be publicized in one nice, convenient place. In that way, your messaging in that four-part formula is critical. It will be consistent. It will be informative and educational. And you will be working along with officials in order to assure the right messaging is delivered. You know, the attributes of a crisis are a disaster include an escalating flow of events, which we absolutely saw in the West Virginia situation. There was insufficient and inaccurate information. Originally, no, there was no information. And then when information started coming out, nobody knew what the chemical was. They didn't know what the chemical would do. There was intense scrutiny, first of the water company itself, and then significantly of Freedom Industries. Complete loss of command and control. Freedom Industries had no control of the messaging or the situation, nor did any of the other poor manufacturers who were affected by it. How you respond can create a secondary crisis. And in this situation, that is absolutely true. People were so angry. There were death threats to employees of Freedom Industries because of the response. Your brand and reputation are sunk. They're under attack. You know, the most when we look at that four-part formula that I showed you, that dehumanized part, to humanize the situation is so important because every crisis at its heart is a human crisis. And you must be able to be empathetic with those people that are affected in your crisis. Silence equals guilt. Freedom Industries <clears throat> um, lacks response to this situation, grew the anger. It uh, All of the parties from public officials, to the water company that was taking all of the heat, to the people themselves that were affected, uh, that growing anger from them equals guilt. And if you're not prepared for the original crisis, in the midst of every crisis, there are always little surprise crises that occur. And that is one of the great elements of, uh, cr of the crisis, is that you're going to be you need to be prepared because there are going to be some other crises that evolve. So as you do your crisis planning, I want you to think about social media as a way for you to be able to message to your local police, to your local school systems, to your local manufacturing peers, so that they can help you through the situation. Review what, what are your concerns? What's keeping you from sleeping at night? Decide what are the obstacles? What's the gap analysis from an actionable crisis management plan point of view? How will you define a disruption, a disaster, a crisis for your company? Do you have senior leadership and your management team support in this? And think about what are you looking for in a crisis management plan. And then with your teams, sit down and start talking about how would we message leveraging social media in a crisis. Use the predict, plan, perform approach. Predict what could happen. Anything could happen. A tornado, a hurricane, an earthquake, a chemical leak into a water supply. Develop your messaging, your policies, your plans, and your procedures. And then implement viable solutions and train and test. 
It's not enough to just say, uh, Joe, you're going to be the official spokesperson if anything terrible ever happens. And um, you know, go think of some things to say just in case. These have to be practiced, scripted, so that when the crisis occurs, you can modify your messaging based on the tool and the exact, the exact situation of the crisis. Please don't let your first response become the secondary crisis for your organization. Determine who's listening as well. You know, everybody thinks, well, I've got to talk to the media because Fox News and CNN and NBC are going to be on this. No, you need to talk to your customers, local authorities, employees, your educational leaders in the community, your board, your vendors, your suppliers, your consultants, your contractors. Everyone on this list and more must be included in your messaging. And that's why it's important to reach out to all of this these constituencies prior to a crisis occurring, understanding where their social accounts are so that they can assist you in leveraging social media should there is a crisis, should there be a crisis, they can help you with your crisis messaging, and then making sure that you are specifically messaging and planning for messaging in advance to this constituency. You also need to know where your audience is. Do you even know who follows you? how they follow you. You say you don't if you say you don't have a social media account, Freedom Industries didn't either. But they needed to know where most of the people talking about their company were. There were a ton of them on Facebook and a ton of them on Twitter. But how would they know? <clears throat> the way you know is through monitoring. You set up a monitoring application. You talk to Blair, talk to Joe, we can talk to you about how you do that how you set it up so that you can effectively protect yourself. Are you going to send them to your website for information? If so, where on your website? <coughs> I had the most challenging time finding any information on Freedom Industries web properties at all. And when I did try to get to their website, eventually when I heard messaging was made, the website crashed. They've never done any server load testing on this kind of a, an influx of a million people suddenly on their web page. So where else could you do messaging? Could you, do you have a, a crisis site, uh, something specifically on a blog that's separate from your primary site where you can send everyone for messaging? I have to say the local water company in West Virginia did a very good job of that. But how do you know where you're going to put this, the information? And then what is the plan to manage all of these different mediums? Again, predict it, plan it, and perform. I did want to show just before we close up that there are some of you that are actively either putting your foot in, into the water of social media or you're actively um, actively leveraging it. And I only got through a, a, a short part of the list on, um, on your association's site. Um, but you can see some of you who may be on the call today are here, and you're all using social media in some different ways. Our Text Knitting Meals is on Facebook. Bosco uh, is a business to consumer, but also business to business. And we would expect them to have sort of a larger social media pres uh, presence. But there are an awful lot of you that are leveraging social media. There are some of you that sort of tried to use social media maybe a couple of years ago, realized how much work it was, and now aren't using it so much. But you still need to know how to access those accounts, how to make sure those accounts haven't been taken over um, uh, or hijacked by uh, spam uh, or hacked by spammers. Um, keep an eye on your accounts, monitor them, and do leverage them. And of course, if you're creating an account, if you feel like, you know, we really should have at least an account called our manufacturing company crisis so that people know where to go, uh, the first account you'll want to follow is certainly at NJMEP on, on Twitter um, because uh, the organization does a great job on their own Twitter account. What next? Well, this is a ton of information crammed into a really small space. Yeah. So hey, one Karen. of the first Yes? Yeah, it's just Blair again. Thanks for answering the question. I, just something I think might be important to, to the group, and, and since you're so close to this, do you see and do you think that 
customers, potential customers, are using social media, um, I mean, it's obvious they're using it as a way to research their potential vendors, but are they going deeper? Are they using it more, in, you know, when you, when they do things like RFPs and when they go out for bids, when they're looking at oh, maybe yeah. creating a relationship? Um, you know, are, are, are they going deeper into the web to find information or is it just a perfunctory sort of let's look at a website and, and sort of see what these guys are doing? I, I don't know if, if people are using it as much as they might be able to and just get your opinion on it because you're so close to it. So the days where you used to just check to see if a company had a website are really gone. Um, you know, well, certainly I'll go to the URL and make sure that they have a valid website, but then I want to see, do they really, you know, is this a real company? Are they really out there? Do they at least own their name on Facebook? Do they at least own their brand on Twitter? Um, Instagram and some of those other ones, while they're important, those are sort of social media, you know, in your junior year. We're going to talk about those, for those just starting out in their freshman year, at least I want to know that you own your brand. Um, and then that you're communicating and engaging with other like manufacturers. You know, Toyota Equipment on Twitter does a great job. Toyota Equipment was created by a guy named Kyle Thrill. And Kyle is just a guy who worked in the facility and he asked the company, would, you know, I'd really like to message on some of the great things we're doing, especially around forklift safety. And they said, give it a try and see what happens. They're now constantly mentioned. And when you look at the top manufacturing, if you Googled top manufacturers using social media, they're always at the top of the list. Um, and just, that was just one guy who tried something and it worked. And the reason is because he used the Twitter account to lead into the Facebook account, to lead into their blog, where they educate people. He just wanted his focus to be education, and it was sincere, and he meant it. So when you look up that company, if you're thinking of them for a vendor, and see the reach and the depth they have, yeah, you're going to want to do business with that company. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do is just say um, thank you. Uh, for letting me talk so long and so fast today. If you have any questions, you can certainly reach out, of course, to Blair, uh, to B. Neville at firestorm.com, uh, to Joe uh, on the call at the uh, association itself. Um, you can also email us questions at webinars at firestorm.com. We'd like to invite you to download a free copy of uh, Disaster Ready People for Disaster uh, Ready America by the three founders of Firestorm. You can just go to our website at firestorm.com and click Learn On Demand, and you can download that book for free and share it with your family as you're having that conversation about please don't use Facebook when I talk to you about some problems we're having at our manufacturing facility. Um, thank you very much to the association for allowing me to speak today. Uh, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. And Blair or Joe, do you have any closing comments? Uh, no, Karen. Thank you very much, though. That was a very uh, informative um, uh, webinar. And um, if anyone does uh, need additional information, uh, our web address is uh, njmep.org, O-R-G. So uh, thanks again. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, again, please feel free to reach out to us. And this will conclude our session for today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you.